Hello, welcome to the third of my videos on aspects of social action, this one dealing with social groups. With apologies to those who don't like sociologies, I must begin with some sociological definitions. In particular, differentiating between groups, categories and ad aggregates, the everyday English word group being too vague for our purposes. For sociologists, a social group can be defined as a number of people who interact together on a regular basis and share a common sense of identity. Such groups vary enormously, from family units and circles of friends to large organisations. In all cases, there is likely to develop a familiarity and solidarity with other members of the group, as well as a shared sense of identity and expectations about what is expected of group members, and some distinction between those who are members of the group and those who are not. Note that this sociological definition excludes both categories and aggregates, which in everyday English are often confused with groups. Here, a social category is any delineation of people who are commonly classified together by other members of society. Examples include school children, uh, single mothers, retirees, uh, left-handed people, agnostics, and Paris taxi drivers. Although members of a particular social category may be grouped together by others, including in some cases by government departments that may use these categories in their forms, those so categorized do not necessarily interact together or associate in any way, nor do they necessarily attach any great importance to the category they share. In the United States and several other countries, for example, it is common to categorize people by their race or more accurately perceived race, to the confusion both of those of mixed racial background and those from other parts of the world who do not categorize themselves by race. Or again, Westerners visiting parts of Asia and the Middle East may sometimes find themselves categorized as such, even though they have little sense of common identity. The ascribed category, bringing together people of different nationalities and native languages. Europeans, Canadians and Americans may not normally have a common sense of identity, but may wrongly be seen as a group when visiting faraway countries. Members of categories can become groups only if they develop some sense of shared identity and start interacting together, as seems to have happened recently to temporary part-time university faculty adjuncts in American universities who have quite suddenly become aware of their shared and extremely marginal occupational role and begun to organize as a collectivity. Again, a category can form a basis for collective action by some of its members, as with those women who came together from the late 19th century onwards to demand the vote for women. Social categories are also often the basis for social stereotypes, a topic which I hope to cover in a future series of videos. Now aggregates. Social groups should also be differentiated from aggregates, which are simply temporary collections of people who are in the same place at the same time, as for example passengers on a bus, spectators at a sporting event, or people waiting together in a doctor's surgery or an airport lounge. They may interact together at some minimal and impersonal level, like forming a queue, for example, but they have no sense of shared identity. This situation can change, however, if some, some incident forces those in the aggregate to think of themselves as a group, as when the bus breaks down in the remote countryside, or the flight is delayed and they must deal with their common plight, perhaps sharing sympathy or even practical support. Hollywood movies sometimes portray such scenarios 
with passengers melodramatically trapped together on a bus with a bomb, as in the movie Speed in 1994, or in a lift in Elevator 2010. Some groups are much more important to us than others, impacting many aspects of our lives and bringing us into personal and familiar association with other people. One useful distinction is that between primary and secondary groups. As noted in an earlier video, the concept of primary groups uh, originates with Charles Fulton Cooley. The primary group is a small and intimate grouping such as a family, a group of close friends or a close-knit neighborhood community. In contrast to larger secondary groups, primary groups are immediate, unspecialized, relatively permanent, and often involuntary groups of people. They consist of a relatively small number of people who know each other fairly well and are linked to other group members in direct face-to-face -face relationships. Their members are often highly involved in the group. Group membership is not some part-time job. A mother is always a mother. A friend is assumed always to be a friend. Relationships between group members are intense, demanding and intimate. At least until the emergence of the modern industrial era, many primary group memberships were normally only terminated by death. And for the young child, membership was not chosen. The child was born into a particular family and neighborhood community and his or her immediate peers were a given part of that social matrix. By contrast, secondary groups are often large and relatively impersonal. They include large schools, universities, corporations, government bureau and the military. Membership is often only temporary and with certain exceptions like prisons and the military a matter of choice. Secondary groups are formal organizations commonly having formal rules of membership and members may be formally defined with specialized roles within the group. Involvement with the group is likely to be based on practical utilitarian objectives rather than strong emotional commitment and the members' social interactions with each other can be relatively limited and even fleeting, lacking the intensity and immediacy of the primary groups, they seem often less genuine and meaningful. In practice, the distinction between primary and secondary groups is not absolute. Newly developing primary groups may form amongst friends and co-workers within the larger organization. Those who spend many years in a particular organization often develop a strong commitment to it. And indeed, many organizations seek to enhance their members' sense of involvement, for example, with uniforms and company social events. As Cooley noted, primary groups, the family in particular, have a fundamental importance in social life as the locus for children's earliest experiences. Whether this is a fulfilling or a tortured experience, it is the all enveloping matrix in which the young child develops a sense of self and becomes properly human, a topic I have covered in a previous video. Our attitudes, behavior and social identity as individuals are generally massively impacted by those involuntary group memberships in our early life. It's common for individuals to belong to several groups, both across their lifetimes and at any particular stage in their lives. A family, a circle of friends, a school or university, a religious congregation, a work organization, perhaps later a home for the aged. Our membership of these groups forms an important basis for our sense of personal identity. Some are likely to be far more crucial to our sense of identity than others, however. And as we go through life, the relative importance of particular groups may change. The set of our group memberships may also be congruent or divergent, with some individuals being embedded in a set of groups with closely overlapping memberships. 
whilst others live in a series of separate worlds defined by the different groups they belong to. Those who belong to groups largely through being born into them often experience the former, as with many who live in traditional societies in which their family is embedded in a village community or close-knit urban neighbourhood and educational, religious and work groups all linked to the community. By contrast, those who choose many of the groups they belong to are more likely to experience the latter, as with those who have moved away from their childhood roots, whether through migration or changes in social status. Now let's talk about reference groups. Those groups we identify with particularly closely often serve as what sociologists call reference groups. That is groups which we use as a standard of judgment in evaluating our own lives or in making decisions as to a course of action to take. These may include our families, the workmates and associates we regard as our peers, and those who are our neighbours. We see our lives in comparison with theirs, we may wish to gain their acceptance and approval for what we do, and may seek to emulate their life choices and style of life. We can also see groups that we would like to join as reference groups and engage in anticipatory socialization as we seek to copy the group's perceived lifestyle as graduate students perhaps do when they decide upon an academic career and assume the mannerisms of professors. Using our peers and neighbours as a reference group may also lead to the invidious comparisons of consumerist culture as described in Thorstein Veblen's analysis of conspicuous consumption. I really ought to make a video on that as well, shouldn't I? It's also possible to have a sense of identity with a reference group without actual membership of the group that we're emulating, or indeed contact with it. Thus, modern celebrity fan culture leads to some fans to fashion their appearance and clothing on the celebrities they admire and to judge their own lives in comparison with them. The movie The Bling Ring uh, provides a somewhat fictionalised version of an actual case where this happened. More tangibly, the rapid growth of the internet has seen the development of virtual groups online, with individuals become connect becoming connected with often large numbers of others via such media as Facebook and Twitter and interacting with them in what may be an intimate and intense fashion reminiscent of a primary group. A strong sense of group identity can develop as a result, as well as genuine friendship and romance, but the possibilities of abuse by internet, internet contacts who cloak themselves in anonymity is real as evidenced by instances of stalking and trolling. Thank you for listening. If you like these videos, you're welcome to subscribe to my channel. I'll try to answer any questions you may have about this video in a future one. By the way, those who want to support the development of the channel can do so through Patreon or PayPal. I'll give details below the video. You can also click the like button so that I can get an idea of which videos our greatest interest to viewers. Have a good day, uh, and next week we'll talk about social statuses and roles.